Merci beaucoup d'être venus si euh, nombreux, nombreux. Euh, bien évidemment, un très grand merci à Starhawk d'être euh, ici. Euh, on va commencer par euh, déjà dire bienvenue. Bienvenue à, à tout le monde. Euh, et et on, va, on a envie d'accueillir tous nos corps ici dans cette pièce serrés les uns contre les autres, tous nos corps et les différentes façons dont nous les vivons et dont nous y, nous, nous y engageons. Bienvenue. We want to welcome our bodies and different ways we experience and engage with them. Welcome. On voudrait aussi dire bienvenue et accueillir les nombreux sentiments que nous éprouvons à l'égard des, des mondes dans lesquels nous vivons. Notre anxiété, peut-être, notre nervosité, notre espoir, notre désespoir, notre terreur, notre confusion, notre sentiment d'impuissance, mais aussi la partie de nous qui se sent connectée, qui se sent puissante et qui se sent heureuse. Bienvenue. We want to welcome our emotions, our joys, our excitements, our grief, our rage, our indignation, our contentment, maybe our disappointments, our nervousness, and our powers. Welcome. Bienvenue à tous nos différents, nos différents niveaux de capacité, celles et ceux qui s'identifient comme ayant un, un handicap, qu'ils soient visibles ou non, et euh, celles et ceux qui, qui n'ont pas cette, ce, ce handicap. We want to welcome all our different ability levels, those who identify as having a disability, visible or invisible, honoring the limitations of this space that is not accessible to all. Welcome. Nous venons accueillir tous nos différents états de santé, celles et ceux qui s'identifient comme étant en bonne santé ou non, celles et ceux qui vivent avec des maladies chroniques, des douleurs physiques. Bienvenue. We want to welcome all our different health conditions, those who identify as healthy or not, those living with chronic illness, those living with physical pain. Welcome. Et bienvenue à toutes les différentes façons dont notre cerveau fonctionne et traite l'information. Bienvenue. And we want to welcome all the different ways our brains work and how they process information. Welcome. Et bienvenue à tous nos différents niveaux d'éducation, celles et ceux qui ont l'expérience de l'éducation formelle à différents niveaux et celles et ceux qui n'ont pas cette expérience, celles et ceux qui sont familiers avec la culture à des, euh, des conférences et, euh, et celles qui ne l'ont pas, bienvenue. And we want to welcome all our educational backgrounds, those with experiences of formal education on different levels, those without that experience, those who are familiar with the kind of conference format, and those who aren't at all. Welcome. Bienvenue à nos différentes façons d'apprendre. L'apprentissage visuel, l'apprentissage verbal, l'apprentissage par la lecture, par l'action, par la résolution de problèmes, par la narration, et toutes les autres différentes manières d'apprendre. Celles qui sont enthousiasmées par la taille de ce groupe et celles qui le trouvent fort intimidant. Bienvenue. And we want to welcome all the different ways we learn. The ways, those of us who learn by seeing, visual learning, those who learn through reading, those who learn through doing things, those who learn through storytelling, or those who learn through problem solving, and all the different ways we learn. And also we want to welcome those who find a huge group like this totally exciting and empowering and those who are terrified of big groups like this. Welcome all of you. Bienvenue à toutes les personnes qui se considèrent comme activistes, organisateuristes, artisanes du changement et toutes celles qui ne s'identifient pas du tout comme ça. Bienvenue. Welcome activists organizers, change makers, and those who don't identify as such, welcome. On voudrait accueillir tous nos genres, euh, celles et ceux qui s'identifient comme trans, comme non-binaires, comme hommes, comme femmes, sur ou hors du spectre du genre, et toutes les façons dont nous exprimons et expérimentons nos genres, bienvenue. 
We want to welcome all our genders, those who identify as trans, non-binary, men, women, on or out of the spectrum of gender, all the ways we experience and express our genders, welcome. Et on voudrait accueillir et dire bienvenue à toutes nos origines, les personnes d'ascendance latino, d'ascendance africaine, d'ascendance moyen orientale, d'ascendance asiatique et euh, pacifique, d'ascendance européenne, toutes les personnes d'ascendance mixte ou multiple, et toutes les personnes à qui ces notions-là ne parlent absolument pas. Bienvenue. We want to welcome all our descents, and even those who are don't recognize by those descents. Welcome. Nous voulons accueillir les, et dire bienvenue aux personnes migrantes, par choix ou non, et à toutes les personnes qui vivent dans le pays où elles sont nées. Bienvenue. Welcome to people who are migrants, by choice or not, and welcome to the people living in the country they were born in. Welcome. On voudrait dire bienvenue à toutes les langues qui sont parlées ici, donc le français déjà, euh, l'anglais, est-ce qu'il y en a d'autres Le breton, l'italien, espagnol, basque, néerlandais, allemand, j'en ai entendu une autre que je n'ai pas, bulgare, portugais. Russe, Polof, Polonais, bienvenue. I don't, know if you remember them all. I don't remember them all and it doesn't matter. <laughs> Welcome to all the languages spoken here. Welcome. Bienvenue à toutes nos classes sociales. Euh, les personnes qui euh, sont issues de la classe ouvrière, de la classe moyenne, de la classe possédante. Celles et ceux qui ne savent pas où elles se situent dans toutes ces définitions, tous les différents contextes de dynamique de classe dont nous sommes issus. Bienvenue. We'd like to welcome all our class backgrounds, working class, middle class, owning class, those who do not know where they fit in those definitions and all the different contexts of class dynamics we inhabit. Welcome. On voudrait accueillir toutes nos sexualités, celles et ceux qui sont sexuellement actifs et actives, et celles qui ne le sont pas, celles et ceux qui utilisent des étiquettes et celles qui n'en utilisent pas, celles et ceux qui s'identifient comme gays, bisexuels, pansexuels, asexuels, hétérosexuels, et toutes les manières dont nous vivons nos sexualités. Bienvenue. We want to welcome all our sexualities, those sexually active and not, those who use labels and not, those who identify as gay, bisexual, pansexual, asexual, heterosexual, and all the ways we experience our sexualities. Welcome. On voudrait accueillir tous nos âges, donc euh, les personnes ici qui ont moins de 10 ans, bienvenue. Les personnes qui ont moins de 20 ans, est-ce qu'il y en a Bienvenue. C'est euh, des personnes qui sont dans leur vingtaine, bienvenue. Dans leur trentaine, quarantaine Cinquantaine Soixantaine Soixante-dix Quatre-vingt Quatre-vingt-dix Bienvenue. Welcome all our ages, welcome. On voudrait accueillir toutes nos croyances, les traditions et nos pratiques religieuses. Celles et ceux qui s'identifient comme athées, agnostiques, chercheurs, chercheuses, païens, païennes, ou rien de tout cela. Bienvenue. We'd like to welcome all our faiths, religious traditions and practices, those who identify as atheists, agnostics, seekers, pagans, or none of the above. Welcome. On voudrait accueillir nos anciens, nos anciennes, nos ancêtres, celles et ceux qui sont encore dans nos vies, et celles et ceux qui n'y sont plus. Bienvenue. We'd like to welcome all our elders, our ancestors, those here in the room, those in our lives, and those who've passed away. Welcome. Et on voudrait accueillir toutes les toutes celles et ceux qui nous permettent d'être ici, um, les les personnes uh, qui uh, qui s'occupent de ce bâtiment, toutes les personnes qui uh, qu'on citera plus tard, qui ont permis à cet événement d'exister. 
tous nos, nos groupes, nos familles génétiques et choisies, euh, nos amis, nos soutiens. Bienvenue. And we'd like to welcome all those who support us to be here. All the team behind this event that we'll name afterwards, all the organizations, the group that runs this, uh, this building, uh, our families, chosen or otherwise, our collectives, uh, our friends, our supporters. Welcome. Et on voudrait aussi uh, accueillir ce territoire que nous habitons et qui nous habite. Et tout nous et toutes les personnes plus qu'humaines sans lesquelles nous ne serions pas ici. Bienvenue. And we'd like to welcome the land that holds us and all the more than humans without whom we would not be here. Welcome. Voilà. On espère que nous sommes tous et toutes bien accueillis dans cet espace. Um, Juste, on va faire deux, trois petits points de, de logistique. Euh, du coup, bah, merci beaucoup d'être venus euh, si nombreux, nombreuses. La soirée va se dérouler euh, avec d'abord une conversation euh, avec, euh, qui sera facilitée par Jay avec Starhawk euh, et, la, et deux membres de la CAR. Thibaut et Nat ici présentes, la CAR étant la cellule d'action rituelle dont on vous parlera. Euh, cette soirée a aussi été euh, organisée par Fichier S, qui est un collectif anonyme, donc qui n'est pas là ou qui est peut-être là. <rire> on ne sait pas. Donc, euh... Et après, après la discussion, il euh, y aura un rituel qui sera mené par, euh, par Starhawk. Et après, il y aura euh, de quoi euh, se sustenter. Un, un, un peu, <rire> avec le bar et les galettes, et, euh, et un DJ set par Mycelium euh, après. Voilà, on vous souhaite une très bonne soirée. Merci beaucoup. Welcome everyone. It's a joy to have to be sitting here. It's also a very big joy to be in this building. Uh, this building, I quite often, we do, there's a few of us who do on the ZAD, uh, things that we call the ZAD Fari. So like a tour of the ZAD, which, where we tell histories of the, of the buildings and the struggle. And when I come to this building, I talk about the link between magic and activism. And how actually both are battles of the imagination, and both are ways of believing that where we put our intention helps create realities and that as using collective power, we can transform reality. And this building, in a way, was part of a many kind of magical acts that were linked with direct action, a diversity of tactics from burning barricades to people in the trees. But this building was built as part of a campaign to build things that were very solid to change the imagination of the ZAD. Because a lot of people thought the ZAD was just a protest camp. Too fast, sorry. A lot of people thought the ZAD was just a protest camp. And the imaginary of a protest camp is it's precarious. It's just huts and tents and it will not last. And colonial patriarchal capitalism will come in and destroy it and build whatever fucking shit they want to build there. But actually, we decided to try and change that imagination to create a material uh, uh, reality that said, we're going to be here for a long time. And we're going to win. And there's never going to be an airport here. And so this was part of it. It was built by medieval carpenters. It is a medieval barn. There are medieval barns in the area that are over a thousand years old. It will be here in a thousand years old. So it was also building the Ambazada with the Basque comrades from Eric Alior and the lighthouse where there was meant to be a control tower. And that was all part of this campaign to say, we are here for a long time. We are not precarious. And there will never be an airport here. So it's very special to be here talking about magic and activism tonight. I'm delighted to be with Starhawk again. Starhawk's been someone who's been an incredible teacher, friend, trickster, fellow trickster, and for the first time, 
I had any contact with Starhawk, I found out just the other day, I was going through my mother's book. She's, de she's dead. My mother died 10 years ago. And I was going through her books and throwing out books, and I found this. Sorry, too fun. <laughs> and I found this, The Spiral Dance. And it... Yeah. So it was a book of my dead mother, and it was a book from by Starhawk, by, given to my mum from me, that said, Dear Mum, hoping that your interest in witchcraft and the occult can go one step further, Winter Solstice 1987. So little, I didn't even know who Starhawk was at the time, I just found the book randomly in a, in a bookshop. And then the next time we met, uh, we never spoke, but I saw Starhawk facilitate an incredible meeting organizing direct actions against the IMF. Starhawk managed to bring a room of several hundred people in a, and a lot of conflict in a lot of different political cultures together in consensus, which was a total act of consensus magic making. And the riots and the actions shut down the IMF meeting in Prague for, for, they only had one day instead of three days of meeting, so good work done. And then we met on the steps of the Diaz school in Genoa, just before the massacre in that school. And I saw Star giving an incredible civil disobedience training. And then she came here and we did a spiral dance on one bit of the runway. She talked with Isabel Stengers in 2016 before the victory and we did this amazing spiral dance, and we will redo a spiral dance later. So thank you so much, Star. Thank you for being here. We also have Nat and Thibault. Uh, Nat and Thibault are part of the Cellule d'Action Rituelle. <laughs> After 2018 and the uh, victory against the airport and then the revenge by the French government, a revenge because we had beaten a major multinational and the French government in terms of the airport, we had won, but also a re revenge because we had lived six years without the police. The revenge was very, very violent, evictions. There was a lot of conflict between us, a lot of trauma. And we set up the Cellule Action Rituelle with Isa and me and us two, uh, and a ghost member. Shall we name him? No, let's not name him. Famous person, we're not telling you who it is. Uh, but he's never there. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we started doing rituals as a tool of care for the community to create another social texture that wasn't meetings, that wasn't action planning, that wasn't assemblies, that wasn't doing chantier together, and so on. So it's a real joy, and it's been a joy working the four of us since 2018 on these many different rituals. So we are here, and the first question, so really the main theme here is uh, why do we need rituals and magic for our movements and activism? And I'll pass the, the microphone to Star. Merci. Ah, je suis très heureuse d'être ici et avoir beaucoup d'intérêt dans la magie en France. Uh, I'm going to speak in English because it'll be better. <laughs> but I look forward to the day when France, when the French language becomes ungendered both for political reasons and because it'll be a lot easier to learn. <laughs> um, yeah, JJ and Isa and I go back a long time. JJ and Isa are some of my great inspirations in the way that they have brought art and imagination into activism. Um, I think particularly when the G8 met in Scotland in 2005, and they spent a year training clowns all over the British Isles 
to create a clown army to face down the police. <laughs> One of the most brilliant, uh, I can't even call it an action. It was so much more than that. And I think we need a lot more of that in our movements today. Um, we've been talking a lot today about the serious situation we find ourselves in both in France and in the United States with the rise of the extreme right and the resurgence of Nazis. And I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean like old 1930s style actual Nazis, which was used to be able to count on the fact in the US that whatever we, else we disagreed on, we all kind of agreed that Nazis were bad. <laughs> and now, unfortunately, we no longer can agree on that. Uh, so it's a very challenging and frightening time. And I've spent a lot of time pondering the question of why do these really awful movements have an appeal to people? Uh, and I think it goes to the question of where ritual can help us. Um, because people are not simply rational beings, much as we would like to believe and sometimes wish that they were. Uh, we are emotional beings. And we need in our lives to have a deeper sense of connection that goes beyond just the rational. Um, I think the right wing provides that in very negative ways that meet some core human needs. The need to feel like you belong to something, uh, the need to feel like you have some value in the world, uh, the need to feel like the world makes sense and has meaning. You know, the easiest and most destructive way to make people feel that they belong is to tell them, those people don't belong, and you do. And the easiest and the most destructive way to make people feel like they have value is to tell people, you, because of some quality you have, maybe your skin color or where you were born, you are the valued people, and those people are not. They are worthless, and they are dangerous, and uh, they don't deserve care and any of the good things that you deserve. And the easiest way to make people feel like the world makes sense and has meaning is to provide some kind of simple meaning, like we're the good people, they're the bad people, and your purpose here is to make sure the good people win and drive out the bad people. Um, that's what we see happening all over the world right now, I think in part because people are recognizing that the system we have doesn't work well for them. And that some of the basic core life support systems of the planet are challenged and collapsing around us. And people are afraid and insecure. So it's very easy to grasp for simple answers. But I think it is our job as people who want to be agents of justice in this world to provide better answers and better stories and better ways of connecting. And to do that, ritual can be an important tool. So when I talk about ritual, I'm not talking necessarily about religion in the sense of a dogma or a belief system. Um, because I think we all have seen how destructive those can be. Um, but I'm talking about ways that we can connect with each other 
uh, that involve our whole self, our emotional self, our sensual self, our rational self, but not just our rational self, and that are important in every culture we know of uh, that's ever existed on the planet. There has never been a culture that didn't have dance and rhythm and drumming and music and song and ceremony and, you know, special dress-up clothing and <laughs> uh, food and all of those things that create that deeper sense of connection. So one of the things that ritual can do is to allow us to connect and to feel like we belong to each other and we are part of one another in a way that doesn't have to do that by making somebody else not belong and othering somebody else. Ritual can also be a powerful force for healing. And you know, those of you who've been activists for a while know that it can get rough. And uh, oftentimes we face violence, we face reprisals, we face disappointment. Um, and ritual is one of the things that can help us face together the things that are too hard to face alone. Um, tonight when we do a ritual, we're going to have some special water in the center that everyone's going to get sprinkled with. And that water is called Waters of the World. And it comes originally from a ritual we did in our community uh, after Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980. And we felt a sense of political despair. So we created a political despair ritual and uh, for Bridget, who's the old Celtic goddess of fire and water. And we had a big punch bowl where we created a holy well, since we didn't happen to have one in San Francisco, <laughs> handy. Uh, and we spoke into bowls of water where we felt our despair and released some of those emotions and then passed the water around again in a different direction and talked about where we felt hope and empowerment. And then we lit candles and we made pledges to Bridget and danced and it was beautiful to see the room light up candle by candle. Um, and uh, the ritual worked in the way magic works. It didn't immediately transform Ronald Reagan or the Republicans. Um, but it opened up an opportunity for us to do something about our despair, which was to take part in a blockade at a nuclear power plant at Diablo Canyon in Central California that was built on an earthquake fault. And that was a very powerful action. It actually delayed the plant's opening for another four years. Um, there was such powerful resistance to that nuclear power plant that our utility company canceled plans for 50 others. And it built a movement um, that really continues to this day. I uh, have political buddies and allies and friends that I first met at Diablo Canyon uh, more than 40 years ago. So um, ritual can be many things, um, but one of the things it can also do is provide a way for us to infuse our lives with meaning and with purpose. And uh, again, a meaning and a purpose that doesn't depend on depriving someone else of their value or their meaning, but brings us together and creates ways for us 
to celebrate belonging to this great community of people who are allies in this world for justice and for the creation of a better world of balance and of love uh, for human beings and for nature and the plants and the animals and all of the living systems that we also belong to. Thank you, Star. And Lacar, why do we need rituals and magic in our movements? Je vais parler en français. Euh, moi, j'ai besoin de revenir sur le parcours euh, qu'on a eu tous les deux avec Thibaut. Nous étions des artistes. Nous faisions des résidences d'artistes. On n'habitait nulle part. On était des espèces de nomades où on ne savait pas, en fait, à la fin, ce qu'on était en train de faire, à quoi ça servait ce qu'on était en train de faire. Il y avait un truc de... C'était vain. On vivait une espèce de crise existentielle. On est tombé sur la ZAD. Euh, et en fait, il y a eu euh, les expulsions qu'on a aussi traversées. Et là, en fait, on a vécu des moments d'une puissance euh, indescriptible. Quelque chose de... qui nous dépassait tellement que une... d'une beauté incroyable au milieu de toute cette violence. Et on est sorti de ça et on ne savait plus du tout qui on était, comment continuer. Enfin, il y avait un truc de, de... de vide intersidéral, quoi. On est revenu sur la ZAD, on a rencontré Jay et Isa, et en fait est arrivé le premier anniversaire de l'abandon du projet d'aéroport. Et où là, il a été question de célébrer une victoire. Mais sauf que cette victoire, elle était teintée de tas de choses complètement euh, traumatisantes, enfin, d'une atmosphère de guerre pas possible, des trahisons qui avaient eu lieu euh, aussi à l'intérieur des conflits qui se retrouvaient... Euh, euh, suite à ces expulsions où c'était en fait impossible de parler de juste de « Hey, c'est la victoire, c'est la teuf, on y va !» Du coup, c'est là, à ce moment-là, qu'on a commencé à parler de rituels et notamment pour une question de « C'est une société traumatisée, c'est un territoire qui a été traumatisé, comment est-ce qu'on adresse ça ?» Et c'est là qu'on a commencé à réfléchir à de quels gestes on a besoin, de quelles histoires on a besoin, de comment on peut euh, faire que ce... Ce ne soit pas du spectaculaire, mais qu'il y ait aussi quelque chose qui nous transforme tous et toutes en même temps. Qu'il y ait quelque chose où il y a un avant et un après, où ce ne soit pas juste des bougies soufflées. Il y a un truc de, de fondateur qui s'est passé là. Euh, je vous passe l'histoire de, de Triton de 30 mètres de long ou de, ou de cœur euh, brisé et, euh, et de vin partagé et de, de, de bombance et de... Enfin, voilà. Et de Bonnie Tyler, bien sûr. Euh, Total Eclipse of the, of the Heart. Euh, et en tout cas, ensuite, à traverser euh, la ZAD et à rencontrer les gens et tout, et nous-mêmes avoir été un petit, enfin, dans une moindre mesure à traverser euh, les expulsions, il euh, y avait euh, toute cette dimension du soin qui a été, mais, qui, qui était phénoménale. Parce qu'en fait, on se, rend compte, on se rendait compte qu'il y avait des tas de gens qui avaient du burn-out de ouf, qui étaient là en mode « mais comment on continue d'être militant, militante ?» En plus, il y avait cette question des négociations qui arrivaient, du coup, ça, ça enlevait tout le côté, euh, je vais mettre des gros guillemets, sexy, euh, d'un combat euh, presque viril aussi contre l'État. Là, d'un coup, ça passait à des négociations qui étaient sur un long terme, qui étaient épuisantes. Et du coup, ça a été euh, là, à ce moment-là, qu'on a commencé à se demander de quoi d'autre on avait besoin, de quel calendrier aussi on avait besoin dans un territoire comme ça. Et là, on a commencé à développer euh, euh, bah, ce qui nous vient euh, dès le début, c'est-à-dire les questions de, de saison qui nous accompagnent. Euh, surtout dans un territoire comme ça, où c'est pas la question de, en fait, on est tous derrière des bureaux et le temps est le même dans tous les bureaux qu'on traverse. Il y a un truc de... Euh, par exemple, l'agriculture, les saisons, c'était hyper important. Donc on est parti sur les équinoxes et les solstices. Et, euh, et on a commencé aussi à évoquer d'autres euh, euh, rituels qui étaient euh, plutôt de l'ordre de euh, euh, Beltane, qui se trouve à la nuit entre le 30 avril et le 1er mai, qui a à voir avec 
la profusion de la vie, la fécondité, la fertilité, mais aussi en miroir la question de la mort et euh, de Samhain qui se trouve dans la nuit du 31 octobre au, au 1er novembre. Euh, parce que si on se projette aussi dans le futur, et c'est ça pour moi la question des rituels ici, c'est se projeter dans un futur. Et du coup, ça évoque aussi les questions de vie et du mort qui sont, de, qui sont capitales. Bonsoir. Euh, effectivement, on a commencé ce travail sur les rituels en janvier 2019, pour la première célébration de l'abandon de l'aéroport. Euh, je voudrais ajouter qu'il euh, y, y a quelque chose aussi dans le fait de prendre soin d'un groupe. Euh, la ZAD, c'est bien, il y a plein de gens, mais il y a du coup plein de conflits qui émergent. Et du coup, le rituel est aussi une, une forme qui permet d'adresser ce, ce, ce problème. Donc, comment on observe la, je sais pas comment appeler ça, mais la psychologie du groupe dans lequel on vit et comment on adresse euh, des gestes qui permettent qu'on continue de se tenir ensemble euh, face à l'adversité. Euh, je pense que moi j'ai un souvenir de juste après ce mois de janvier euh, 2019. On a des gens du groupe d'Abracadabois qui euh, s'occupent de la forêt ici, qui sont venus nous voir parce qu'ils devaient ouvrir des négociations, ou en tout cas euh, les mener avec l'ONF. Et du coup, il y avait un changement de régime. On n'était plus dans une occupation illégale de la forêt où on pouvait euh, la gérer euh, avec le, la vision qu que ces personnes en avaient. Mais une reprise en main de l'État sur ce, sur ce territoire aussi, à travers cette institution. Et qui, du coup, euh, nous ont demandé euh, de concevoir avec euh, le un, un rituel pour les aider dans ces négociations. Ce qu'on a fait... Euh, avec grand plaisir, sans trop savoir où on allait, parce que c'était la deuxième fois et que c'était un peu étonnant pour nous aussi. Euh, mais je crois que là, il y a un truc qui est hyper intéressant dans la fonction de la rituelle, c'est euh, comment on l'utilise pour s'armer, pour se mettre dans un état d'esprit, euh, collectivement, pour nous aider à surmonter euh, certaines épreuves et certaines actions. Ah oui, c'est ça. Oui, effectivement. Euh, Nat parlait des rituels saisonniers. Et euh, je pense que c'est important, effectivement, pour la paysannerie et euh, les gens qui cultivent euh, les terres, mais aussi euh, pour tous ceux qui vivent ici. C'est euh, la grande différence avec, euh, avec le fait de vivre euh, dans une ville. C'est qu'on subit, effectivement, on subit ou on accepte de vivre avec ces changements saisonniers, de les accompagner. Et ces rituels sont aussi là pour... Euh, pour nous aider à, à adapter nos, nos corps et nos esprits à ça. Et, euh, et c'est intéressant parce que du coup, on se retrouve avec euh, une forme de pratique plus païenne, d'observation du monde, de euh, sensibilité à, à, aux êtres qui nous entourent, qu'ils soient euh, animal, végétal euh, ou autre. Et euh, je pense que c'est important, cet ancrage, ce sentiment d'appartenance à la fois à une communauté et à un territoire, ça donne une force dans euh, l'action politique aussi. Par exemple, euh, Beltane qui évoquait euh, Nad juste avant, c'est un rituel assez important pour nous parce qu'il est dans la nuit du 30 avril au 1er mai. Et du coup, c'est vraiment... Euh, ouais. euh, c'est vraiment euh, le moment où on peut euh, tisser ensemble à la fois nos pratiques païennes et nos pratiques politiques. Et du coup, avoir un rituel où on euh, va préparer des œufs de peinture pour aller les balancer euh, sur la préfecture le lendemain en manif. Et du coup, tout ça, c'est important parce que ça crée vraiment une, une forme de... On peut utiliser des gros mots comme culture, mais une forme d'histoire commune qu'on vient retravailler ensemble. L'idée, c'est effectivement de ne pas faire des dogmes, comme l'a évoqué Starhawk. C'est vraiment d'avoir des, des histoires, des petites histoires qu'on se raconte et qu'on ajuste euh, quand on en a besoin. Et, euh, et qui viennent en fait nous aider à... dans la lutte, quoi. Voilà. English, yes. Thank you. So we're going to go for. So uh, we're living in a time where there's a massive rise of uh, witches uh, on social media and the internet. Um, 
the hashtag witch talk on TikTok has 42 billion views. The simple hashtag witch has 25 billion views and the baby witch hashtag has 600 million views. That's a fuck of a lot of witches. <laughs> so how do we, you know, we, how do we inhabit this, those worlds? Is it political? Is the kind of witch talk phenomena a political phenomena beyond the kind of girl power and feminist empowerment that it has, clearly has in some aspects? And can we influence the influencers somehow? Uh, is this a territory we should inhabit like this territory or, or not? Well, clearly I'm not spending enough time on TikTok. <laughs> You know, I always feel mixed about social media. I use it, of course. Um, and when COVID happened, we suddenly had to shift and do everything online, from teaching permaculture, which is something I do a lot of, uh, to teaching magic online. Um, and over the last three or four years, I feel like we've gotten better at it. I have more of a sense of what does work online and what doesn't. And some aspects of magic can work quite well online. Um, guided meditations, for example, can. And others, like raising energy, just don't work the same way. Um, but in general, I would say the important thing to remember about magic is that it works when you ground it by also doing something in physical reality. Um, the definition I always like for magic is the art of changing consciousness at will. It comes from Dion Fortune, who was a... British occultist. Um, I have been doing every Friday morning, well, morning in California, <laughs> uh, an Instagram political magic meditation um, that was inspired by some of the work Dion Fortune did during World War II of organizing her occult group to uh, meditate and bring spiritual forces to prevent Hitler from invading Britain. Um, there are also stories of witch covens that did rituals to prevent him from invading, and they seem to have worked. Oh, there were also witch covens that did rituals to prevent Hitler invading Britain, and um, they seem to have worked. Uh, so I think we, we can't ignore social media. Um, it's a time in the world where it's important to learn to use it, but to also, again, remind people that it's the same with organizing and activism. You know, far too much activism is people writing, you know, angry comments to each other on... Twitter or Facebook or whatever is the latest social media and not actually getting out there and organizing and doing things. Um, I have been using Substack recently. I've been writing a book on building regenerative movements and I decided to put it out on Substack chapter by chapter rather than trying to write the whole thing and get it published in a more traditional way. So we'll see how that goes. And I also have a podcast that we just launched that goes with it. So uh, I'd say it's a journey. <laughs> but again, I say this over and over, it has to be grounded in doing some real work in physical reality. And so, Lacar, we don't even have a website or an Instagram or a TikTok. 
Uh, we have an email now. We do have an email. <laughs> uh, yes, I spent a lot of time on Instagram. Uh, and I was also looking at the... Ah, oh, sorry, I was speaking English. Hey, je passe beaucoup de temps sur Instagram. <laughs> euh, et j'ai aussi beaucoup regardé euh, ce qui se passait avec euh, euh, contre Trump en 2016 et notamment euh, toutes ces organisations de sorcières qui se retrouvaient chez elles. D'accord. À, à faire euh, un samedi par mois, je crois, en pleine lune, je ne sais plus. Euh, à faire euh, un, un rituel euh, pour contrer Trump, qui semble à plusieurs moments avoir marché, parce qu'il s'est pris quand même plein de, de, de procès, euh, plein de moments euh, durant son mandat. Bon, maintenant, il faut, faut y retourner, quoi. Et il y avait aussi beaucoup d'humour dans la manière dont, parfois, elle se, elle se créait ça, parce qu'il devait y avoir, par exemple, un élément orange pour rappeler euh, la chevelure flamboyante euh, de Trump. Et notamment, des fois, c'était un Cheetos, quoi. Enfin, vous voyez, ces trucs de chips... Moi, je trouvais ça mais génial. Après, il y avait un truc de sentiment de communauté qui était hyper puissant dans ce cas-là. Et c'était genre Facebook. Bon, maintenant, c'est old school. Mais ça n'empêche qu'il y avait un truc qui se passait. Et c'est vrai que tout l'enjeu, maintenant... Et c'est vrai que maintenant, tout l'enjeu, c'est de... c'est de sortir de chez soi aussi. Enfin, c'est de... Quand on voit la puissance euh, de l'extrême droite à pouvoir se rassembler sur des forums, sur 4chan, à euh, détourner euh, des trucs de pop culture pour en fait des éléments de, de rassemblement de ouf, d'avoir une puissance de, 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 d'organisation incroyable. C'est vrai qu'il y a des trucs euh, qui paraissent euh, incroyables. Et en même temps, euh, quand je suis arrivée ici et que j'ai porté une charpente euh, tranquillou avec, euh, je ne sais pas, 150 personnes... Et qu'il euh, y a euh, un type qui s'est retourné vers moi avec euh, aussi la larme à l'œil en me disant « Mais tu vois tout ce qu'on peut faire ensemble ?» Moi, j'étais en mode « Mais oui Mais oui !» Enfin, vraiment, j'étais en prise d'enthousiasme de ouf. Euh, et du coup, je n'ai pas de réponse sur ça. Mais en tout cas, euh, avec euh, Fichier S comme sorcière qui a aussi œuvré contre Bardella, on peut se dire que ça a un tout petit peu marché. Et peut-être on peut continuer dans ce genre d'activité et utiliser euh, TikTok, Facebook... N'importe quoi qui pourrait fonctionner, on y va, on y va. Enfin, voilà. Faites des photos de vous avec des Cheetos, ça va être super, il faut y aller. Un Cheetos, c'est un type de, de curly, chut, chut, pas de marque, mais... <rire> c'est, ouais, c'est un truc qui se mange, c'est un peu mou, un peu craquant, et il euh, y en avait qui avaient des formes qui, limite, avaient des têtes de mec. Voilà, c'est une cacahuète soufflée, pour, euh, si vous voulez gommer les marques de cette, de cette vidéo. So we're going to open it up in about five minutes, but we just got a last question, which is, uh, so um, it's interesting that Nat, uh, they say, uh, you know, humor is important. And in the car, uh, humor is really important. Actually, we, we are really against solemn rituals. And we really try, you know, we kind of believe that we're born with a punk and a hippie gland. Everyone is born with a punk and a hippie gland, and the aim of life is to find the balance between the punk and the hippie gland. (laughs) And rituals can tend to towards one side, we know well. Um, And so uh, we use a lot of pop culture, and uh, we we call what the aesthetic uh, animist kitsch. Uh, And uh, of course we know that the term animism comes from Taylor, who was a colonial anthropologist, who used the term to Sorry, I'm going way too fast. (laughs) So we know it came from Taylor, who was a colonial anthropologist, who used it as a derogatory term, of course, against the colonized people. Uh, And he used it to identify uh, things that people would never identify themselves. Most people who had an animist uh, 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 life would never call themselves animists. Uh, And as we know, Uh, only the non-believer believes what the believer does is belief. (laughs) Try translating that one, Isa. (laughs) Only, it's a good one, 
only the non-believer believes what the believer does is belief. Get it? And animism is not a belief, but a felt experience of the world, and a felt experience of a world that is alive in all its aspects, that's full of people, some of whom are human. So in Spiral Dance, you talk about the need for a new religion, the religion of the goddess, which you say is the oldest Western religion. Uh, and we know we have to change the way we relate and sense the world if we want to avoid the ecological and social collapse that is already happening in many parts of the world. Uh, and, uh, but do you think we achieve this by setting up a religion? Uh, I would say if a religion is like a dogma or something you have to believe, thank you. No. Um, but if a religion is a shift in your experience of the world, um, you know, if you look at that tree outside there and you recognize there's a leaf on that tree that uh, is performing a miracle of taking sunlight, um, using its energy to transform air and water into food, and doing an alchemical process so complicated that I would have to study up for days to explain it to you. <laughs> and then that leaf is going to fall someday and decay back into the earth. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of living creatures that are going to take it apart, that are going to use its elements, that are going to interact with the roots of that tree to feed that tree. And this incredible cycle is going on all around us. And when you experience that with a sense of awe and amazement and wonder and reverence and beauty, then first of all, it feeds you in a way that just understanding it intellectually can't. Although if you do understand it intellectually and you can link that to that sense of awe and wonder, it deepens it. And uh, it doesn't have to be, we don't have to, you know, get rid of science in order to connect to the earth. It can help us connect more deeply. And then when you feel yourself as part of that cycle, uh, you know, then if your religion becomes ways, again, of creating ritual, of meditation, of um, learning, of all the things that connect you more deeply to those cycles so you can work with them and you can see yourself as Mother Nature's, you know, appreciating eyes and healing hands and work with her to transform this world around us and help heal it and regenerate it, then that, I think, is what we need. Do you... Euh, je vais. Euh, enfin, il y, avait, il y avait deux parties dans ta question, un peu sur comment on, on se réapproprie des, des formes d'histoire. Parce que nous, ce qui nous a intéressé beaucoup dans la carte, c'est euh, OK, on va faire des rituels, on se demande quelle culture on a. Mais en fait, on ne sait plus vraiment, puisqu'on on vient de, de cultures déterritorialisées. Euh, on a grandi dans des espaces où moi j'ai déménagé je ne sais pas combien de fois quand j'étais gosse. Euh, je ne vis plus du tout là où j'ai grandi. Du coup, j'ai plus cette connexion à, à un espace qui m'a vu naître. Et euh, comment dans tout ça, on se trouve un terrain commun euh, En fait, 
pour nous, c'était un commun, c'est euh, combien d'heures on a passé à regarder Buffy ou euh, Charmed ou euh, ce genre de choses. Et du coup, la pop culture est très importante, mais sans oublier qu'il y a déjà eu des pratiques avant, mais que ces pratiques, on ne peut pas non plus en avoir euh, une vision exacte. Quand on regarde euh, la culture celtique, par exemple, euh, dont on s'est inspiré du, du, du calendrier avec les équinoxes, les solstices et les fêtes intermédiaires, ben, ce qu'on a dessus, c'est des traces souvent des traces écrites par des gens qui étaient plutôt chrétiens. Enfin, et du coup, on, on a intérêt à être plutôt euh, prudent avec ça. Euh, par exemple, euh, je sais qu'à un moment, on a beaucoup regardé euh, les cultes dionysiaques euh, dans la période pré-patriarcale, -patri pré-hellénistique, voilà, pour faire un peu un télo. Euh, c'est hyper intéressant, mais on ne sait pas vraiment ce qui s'y passait. Du coup, c'est aussi des histoires qui nous parviennent et on a un, un, tout intérêt à les prendre comme ça, comme des histoires que nous, on peut euh, modifier et rejouer et re, euh, re scotcher en quelque sorte avec nos propres histoires de la trilogie du samedi soir. Euh, et c'est là où... Euh, enfin, je parlais des histoires euh, un peu plus tôt. C'est aussi là où tu peux créer un sentiment d'appartenance de, 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 commune. Je veux dire, on se partage les histoires drôles, on se partage euh, les histoires de films. Et pourquoi on ne se partagerait pas les histoires qu'on écrit nous-mêmes, ensemble euh, C'est un peu un des, des terreaux, j'ai l'impression, de, de, du travail qu'on mène dans la car. Euh, en dehors de la pop culture euh, qui nous anime beaucoup, euh, c'est aussi pouvoir travailler avec euh, des éléments symboliques qu'on trouve aussi euh, dans le territoire même. Enfin, par exemple, euh, la figure du triton euh, qu'on a beaucoup utilisé parce que en fait, euh, là c'est la partie scientifique, où en fait quand on coupe une partie de son corps, donc il y a une... son corps repousse. Et donc à l'intérieur de ça, on a vu un schéma, une vidéo qui montrait les cellules pluripontantes qui donc se dédifférencient euh, pour pouvoir recréer euh, l'élément qui manque. Et donc, du coup, il y avait un peu un truc de « Ah, génial, toutes ces euh, cellules pluripotentes qui ont des couleurs différentes, on n'a qu'à faire euh, des espèces d'entités de, de, masquées, pleines de couleurs, qui vont représenter aussi euh, ces, ces forces d'action. » Enfin, du coup, il y a un peu un truc de, de pouvoir se nourrir du territoire et de recréer des histoires à partir de ça, et pouvoir euh, en faire des formes qui, après, ont l'air complètement euh, peut-être absconses, mais, euh, mais où il y a un truc de... Euh, de la magie qui se passe, quoi. Là où d'un coup il y a des gens qui se disent euh, Moi j'ai participé à un truc, c'était chelou. Il y a un avant et il y a un après. Il y a un truc qui n'est pas tout à fait visible. Il y a une perte du langage à ce, à, dans ces moments-là d'une certaine façon parce qu'on a partagé euh, quelque chose ensemble et on ne sait pas très bien ce que c'est. Et c'est pas grave. Et ça, c'est hyper fort, je trouve. Euh, et oui, et. Moi, j'ai l'impression aussi que dans cette expérience-là, il y a ce qui, en termes de, de ce qui nous relie, de ces histoires, en fait, c'est aussi une expérience singulière qui, est, qui, est, euh, qui appartient à un groupe et qu'on ne peut pas non plus l'exporter. Euh, ce n'est pas un schéma qu'on peut reproduire à l'infini et, euh, et duquel on sortirait, je ne sais pas, une église euh, mondiale. Euh, ça, je pense, je pense vraiment pas qu'on peut, parce qu'il y a toutes ces particularités qui sont euh, nos, nos cultures euh, intimes, enfantines, euh, territoriales euh, et plus ancestrales, qui se mêlent et qui, du coup, sont euh, spécifiques à un territoire. Thank you, merci, uh, English. Thank you, Lacar. Uh, so, this is the moment for you to ask some questions. We've got half an hour. Uh, do we have a roving microphone for the questions? No, we don't. We do have a roving microphone. We do. Yep, this is the roving microphone. Does someone want to rove? Do you want to be a rover? So Julia is going to rove for us. There's a hand over there. Someone.
Thank you. Uh, it's a question for Starhawk. Um, you mentioned rituals um, sustaining and encouraging hope. And I saw recently on your Instagram that uh, there is hope with uh, Kamala Harris in the US. Can you name uh, concrete rituals that you're doing, maybe already, or that you plan on doing to sustain hope and to um, um, encourage um, what we all feel like, uh, um, yeah, some freedom and, uh, and, and more uh, ecological power with her candidacy? Yes. Um, you know, during the debate with uh, Trump and Biden, I was watching it with some of my witchy friends, uh, actually up in Canada where I was teaching. And we were very excited to see Biden take him down. And then the debate started, and it was awful. <laughs> and we were visualizing, um, we were using the image of the Statue of Liberty, which uh, we use a lot as a symbol of liberty, uh, which interestingly was a gift from France to the US. I don't know why France decided to give the US a gift, but thank you. <laughs> um, but I always think of her as the American goddess. And she holds that torch of truth up. You know. And she also represents welcome to the immigrant. And there's a beautiful poem on the base of her statue that welcomes immigrants. Uh, and I see her sort of um, melded with the justice card in the tarot who's holding up the sword of accountability. So we were visualizing truth and maybe it worked because in the way we didn't expect because it became clear that Biden um, just didn't have energetically what it took to counter Trump. And it set off a terrible three weeks where really everyone was in uh, a state of absolute terror and despair about the upcoming elections um, and really not knowing what to do. Um, the only happy thing that happened during that time was the French elections. <laughs> And then when Biden dropped out, I have never felt such a powerful energetic shift. I mean, it was, you could feel the energy change. It, you know, like when you're standing in the ocean and the tide switches from one direction to another. It was so clear. And what I noticed is all of the pundits and all of the politicians keep talking about it in terms of energy, even though none of them, is, to my knowledge, are witches and think about the world that way. Um, but it's made me think about our elections and your elections, that maybe it's helpful to look at them through the lens of energy and say, well, it's not, maybe it's not that people like Trump's policies, I mean, they don't. You know, all the polls show that 60, 70 percent of Americans agree with most of the progressive policies, whether it's abortion or medical care or environment. But I think people respond on an unconscious level <laughs> to the energy and. Um, Trump, in his mean, malevolent way, projects what feels to people like a powerful energy. And I think that's true of many of the alt-right. And Biden just couldn't do that, even though 
he actually was very, very good and skilled at actually governing. Um, and, you know, I didn't like everything he did, but he actually got more progressive stuff done and passed in an environment where there was almost no way to do that than any other president we've had since Lyndon Johnson. Um, but when he dropped out, that let Kamala come in and she's like channeling, <laughs> it's like she could be the Statue of Liberty come to life. You know, she's really channeling that energy very powerfully and suddenly all of these depressed, gloomy, you know, <laughs> despairing people, now we're all hopeful <laughs> and people are signing up like never before and volunteering and raising money. Uh, and I'm feeling very optimistic about it. And just today she chose her vice president, um, which I'm really happy about because uh, the guy she chose, Tim Waltz, is one of the most progressive of the candidates that she might have chosen. Um, and I think is also very good at speaking and very funny. He's the one who started calling all the Republicans weird. <laughs> and I think as JJ was saying, like, we have to have humor to get us through. The humor is one of the great counter spells, you know, to the nasty spells of the alt-right. Um, but the kind of humor that's not laughing at someone else's expense you know, but just laughing because you recognize a truth that needs to be told. There is a question here. Bonsoir. Une question qui s'adresse à tous les trois. Um, si on pouvait traduire en même temps. Um, vous avez beaucoup parlé de raconter des histoires, comme enfin, la, le lien entre la magie et les histoires. Est-ce que euh, tous les magiciens et les magiciennes et les sorcières sont des raconteurs et des raconteuses d'histoires A l'inverse, est-ce que les gens qui racontent des histoires sont tous des magiciens et des magiciennes Est-ce que vous pensez que les gens dont sont les métiers d'écrire des histoires ont tous conscience de ce pouvoir Et est-ce que vous pensez, je pense par exemple aux séries télé, puisque vous en parliez tout à l'heure, la pop culture Et auquel cas, est-ce que vous pensez qu'il y en a certains qui ne sont pas en train de faire de la magie noire euh, Quel intérêt, par exemple, de, des, récits, des récits dystopiques, selon vous, hein, euh, dans, voilà, dans, dans ce, sous cet angle de la, de la magie et de faire advenir le, la réalité avec euh, les histoires Merci. I don't know if all the storytellers uh, who write for television think of themselves as magicians consciously. I'm sure they don't. Um, but I do think that stories shape our imagination. And, um, you know, it's a magical teaching that to make something happen, you first have to envision it and imagine it. And it is alarming when you think about how few stories there are that envision a positive future. Um, you know, it's in an industry that's profit-driven, it's always easy to grab people's attention through fear and through violence and through horror. And I think that's why we see so much of it. Um, but there is also a genre of storytelling that's new and still small but growing called solar punk that's really about envisioning positive visions of the future. And I find that hopeful. You know, I've written some of my own, which are kind of a mix of dystopian and utopian. 
and I hope that more people will also start to envision some of the positive ways that we might transform the world. And it's part of the intention for our ritual later tonight. We have another question here. Uh, thank you, thank you to be here. Uh, oh, please, please. Désolé, je vais répondre à. à la désolé, question. désolé. Euh, oui, je pense que si on parle en termes de, de, de magie ou de sorcellerie, enfin, par exemple, le, rien que le fait de lancer un sort en anglais, c'est tout spell, et du coup, on voit le rapport avec le langage, Alors, que ce soit une forme poétique ou autre, on, on véhicule une histoire à travers ça, qu'on crée une recette, qu'elle soit pour faire un rituel ou ou même à manger pour ses amis. Si on veut que ce soit bon, il faut qu'on se raconte l'histoire qui va avec. Euh, je ne pense pas que toutes les personnes qui écrivent de la fiction euh, soient dans, dans ce truc de vouloir, enfin de se dire d'avoir un, un tel pouvoir de, de changer le monde. Euh, parce que s'il y a, je pense, enfin, moi j'ai un désert plastique, il y a beaucoup cette idée que euh, on ne doit pas, euh, comment dire on est un peu détaché de ce qu'on dit, puis c'est un peu de la responsabilité des gens qui réceptionnent de, de faire avec. Euh, moi, je pense que c'est pas vrai. Euh, je pense qu'on a une responsabilité vis-à-vis -vis de ça. Euh, et que, effectivement, véhiculer seulement des histoires de, de fin du monde, un, ça interroge. Et par exemple, le cas de la dystopie. Je pense que la dystopie, elle est là dans un, un premier temps pour être un, un cadre critique en poussant des curseurs de qu'est-ce qui pourrait arriver et qu'est-ce que ça nous ferait, mais que souvent on tombe dans une forme de fascination de, 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 du fascisme en quelque sorte, euh, une fascination de l'horreur, et qu'on y met peu le contrepoint de « ok, mais comment on fait pour faire des belles choses là-dedans euh, »« Comment on fait pour, pour tenir, pour, euh, bah pour que ce ne soit pas juste euh, cette espèce de ouais, la fascination des armes, de la guerre, de, de la violence ?» Euh, effectivement, il y a le solar punk qui, est, euh, qui existe, qui n'est qui est pas un mouvement très répandu, enfin qui a un peu du mal à, à démarrer, euh, et qui prend le, le pendant inverse, du, par exemple, du cyberpunk, où on est dans cette euh, ultra-libéralisation euh, surnumérisée, où les gens se mettent des broches dans le cerveau pour euh, faire du euh, trading hyper rapide, et survivre euh, de façon très précaire. Du coup, le solar punk prend l'inverse de ça, mais... Euh, je pense qu'il le prend trop. Enfin, il faut aussi se souvenir pourquoi on lutte. Et, euh, et du coup, il doit y avoir une, une zone entre les deux qui nous aide vraiment à avoir des, des récits qui, euh, qui nous donnent de la puissance. Quoi. Pour moi, il y a aussi un rapport euh, au pouvoir de la fiction en général. Enfin, grâce à l'imaginaire, on peut se dire... Bon sang, et si jamais cet, cet aéroport, il n'avait jamais lieu C'est d'une puissance folle comme récit. Fin. Et là, là, vous êtes là. C'est quand même un récit qui fonctionne. Et c'est euh, aussi euh, dans, euh, par exemple, les, les jeux de rôle. Euh, la, 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 question, la question du « as if », et c'est la même chose que celui qu'on a quand on est enfant, quand on se dit « on n'a qu'à faire comme si ». On dirait que toute cette, euh, cette disposition qu'on a de l'imaginaire qui nous permet de transformer le monde, elles sont d'une puissance incroyable. Du coup, je ne dirais pas que tous les gens qui écrivent sont des magiciens, mais il y a quand même un pouvoir du, du langage. Et juste lire des livres, regarder des films, et, et c'est là où on te demande de, de suspendre ton jugement. Enfin, Il y a un truc où tu rentres dans un autre univers, et d'un coup, tu en acceptes toutes les règles. C'est un pouvoir de folie. Donc, euh, Je ne sais pas si ça répond un peu, mais... Um, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, seven minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for coming here. First of all, I, I would like to react to what I heard about Kamala Harris, because I'm sorry, but if you put any hope in Kamala Harris, I don't know what, what to say. I mean, like, um, just a short about this. Uh, there is this uh, little sentence I like, uh, which says that the, the two-party system, the, these two parties, they are the two chicks of the same bot. 
And I really like this uh, formula. So uh, I will finish for, for, for this. My question was about, um, I heard a few years ago, uh, I, I guess you all know uh, John Bez, the, the singer. And she, she did write a, a song about uh, what, an experience she, 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 she had uh, during his, her childhood um, about uh, ritual abuse. And I know in the, in the United States you had uh, this uh, whole uh, period of, uh, uh, you, you call the satanic uh, panic. You know, where evangelical uh, groups, they, they uh, for part, I guess, they made up a lot of stories about, oh, yes, I was a satanic priest and I discovered Jesus and, uh, oh, please uh, join us. Well, I, know. I guess a lot of those things are made up, but I'm afraid that for, for a part, this is not made up. And jo John Bayes was really, really clear about what she experienced. And she is not the only one. So many, many of uh, those stories are... You know, and even in Europe, in France and uh, in uh, Belgium, we have some kind of scandals and, and things like this. So I just, uh, yeah, I'm going to make it short. I just would uh, like to have your, your opinion about this uh, phenomenon of uh, uh, ritual abuse, which I guess you're not part of, <laughs> of course. Abuse. Satanic ritual abuse, c'est euh, abus sexuel, euh, abus, pardon, oui, ce sont des abus sexuels, mais c'est des abus rituels dans le cadre, euh, voilà, de... de Yeah. Je ne sais pas, j'en suis pas, j'en suis pas, donc je peux pas vous donner plus de précision. Well, first, uh, let me just say about Kamala Harris that in the United States right now, voting for her is not going to bring about the revolution, but it is vitally important. It's a short-term strategy has to be to stop Trump from getting back in office and stop the rise of the alt-right. And it is not at all true that the Democrats and the Republicans are two cheeks of the same butt. Uh, they're very, very different at this point in the US. And uh, It's that kind of thinking that got us Trump in the first place, actually. It was people saying, oh, You know, Clinton and Trump, there's no difference. Well, there's this huge difference. And if you live in the United States and you are a person capable of getting pregnant, um, it is a difference of life and death. If you are an immigrant in the United States, it can be a difference of life and death. If you are a child living in poverty in the United States, it can be a difference of life and death. And that makes a difference, even though it's not the ultimate difference we'd like to see of transforming the whole system. So the short-term strategy is that we stop the fascists. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and France, you know, Getting the left and the center to unite and do that was a big step. I know it wasn't, you know, again, the total, like, utopian transformation we'd love to see, but it definitely was better than having the right in power. Uh, then the long-term strategy has to be building a much more powerful progressive movement um, that's much more broad-based and that can... Uh, actually make our policies the mainstream, which, again, they are in the sense that most people actually agree with them, but there's a lot of work to do to make them realized in the U.S. And I could say a lot more about that, but we don't have time. <laughs> As for the ritual abuse, Uh, that was a huge conspiracy theory in the 80s. Now, I don't doubt that there is tremendous child abuse in the U.S. and other places, and tremendous sexual abuse. Um, some of it may be done in the form of ritual, but the idea that there were huge satanic conspiracies abducting hundreds of thousands of children um, never was true 
and was like the fake news of its time. Um, and it ruined innocent people's lives. Um, you know, there were psychotherapists who worked with children in really destructive ways uh, that instead of actually giving children the chance to talk about what was really happening sort of led them into making false accusations against people. Uh, there was a lot of really awful stuff that went on. Um, so I'm not of the opinion that, again, these are great satanic conspiracies. This thing rises up periodically. You know, it has kind of come back again in the form of QAnon. Uh, and there's never any actual truth to it. You know, the truth is that there's tremendous amount of abuse of children, and the vast majority of it is very mundane and done by people within the family or step families or people that you know. <laughs> and it's not nearly as exciting as those theories would have it be. Thank you. I think... Yes, wow, look at that, one minute late. Um, we... Sorry? Um, I think we. I think we can. Is it okay if we keep going because we were running a bit late? Thank you. You can maybe ask it one to one afterwards. And thank you. Uh, so um, we. There's two options, in fact, uh, which we. Uh, so Fisher S uh, is this coven that was set up uh, apparently um, by some people around France and other places to do a binding, inspired by the 2016 binding ritual against Trump, to do a binding ritual against Jordan Bardella on the night before the second tour of the elections. Um, we have, uh, and it was to repeat this action at 23.23, so 11.23, every new moon. So a lot of people did it yesterday. Uh, we obviously did it the d before the elections and we see that it worked very well. Who's heard of Jordan Bardella now? He's definitely not prime minister, uh, as many people feared. We have a five minute little film that introduces the ritual. Do we want to watch that before the ritual now? As, have, who's seen it? Just out of interest, who's seen the film? Okay, not so many people. Do shall we watch? Shall we watch? Get us into the ritual mood. It's five minutes long. Yeah. Okay, and then we'll go and do the ritual. Okay.
Comme Peter Carroll, euh, un des inventeurs de, de la magie de chaos, dit la, la magie ne marche pas en théorie. The magic doesn't work in theory, only in practice. Elle ne marche pas en théorie, mais seulement dans la pratique. Et allez, on va aller dans la pratique. We're going to go into practice. So, why are we here? So, we are going to do a spiral dance. On over there, uh, because the last time Starhawk came, we did a spiral dance on the other runway, runway one. Here was runway two. So we got rid of both runways, but we thought it would be quite nice to be on the second runway uh, and do the spiral dance there uh, as a way to build power to think about how to route our movements. But Star will tell more about... Um, the intention. So, when we were talking about what is needed right now, and we were thinking about Lazad going through this transformation from being this action camp to being a more long-term rooted community. And thinking also about the challenge of 
building this larger movement as a whole and that I think many of us who've been involved in the movement for a long time have been through many cycles of exciting activism and then what's next kind of. So uh, our intention is really to take the energy of this fertile creative resistance and root it uh, to grow and make real our visions and dreams. And does that sound like an intention we can all support? Do you want me to say it again? <laughs> to take the energy of this fertile resistance and root it to grow uh, the power and make real our dreams and our visions. Yeah? 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 <laughs> Okay, good. And we thought of the image of the tree. There's a bay tree that's been here for, what, hundreds of years. Um, yeah. So we're going to uh, be using the bay. The bay is from one of the hedges where we, uh, Isa and I, live at the Rolandière, and it was planted 200 years ago. And this bay has survived the airport project. Survived the remembrement, uh, survived this death that was planned for it. And the bay is a, a very important plant in many, many, many different cultures. Uh, it's a symbol of victory. It's also uh, the reason that the kings and the emperors wore bay leaves was because actually they were led by the people on the edges, by the visionaries, by the witches, by the sorcerers, by those who were actually burning the bay leaves and inhaling the bay leaf smoke to see the visions of the future. So we're going to be burning some bay leaves. The bay is also a sacred tree uh, to the indigenous people, the Pomo, where I live, the California Bay, but it's the cousin. Um, and so we're going to process out to the ritual ground following the banner. Uh, we're going to make a circle. Um, and we'll ground and we'll honor the elements. Then we'll have a moment to think about the transformations that we want to make. And then we'll dance a spiral. When we dance a spiral, we spiral in and out and back in again, we'll get a chance to pass everybody and look them in the eye and honor their energy and their being. Um, but with a glance, it's like a drive-by honoring, not a long lingering honoring. Because <laughs> the spiral needs to keep moving. Um, don't worry about the dance steps. You can walk it. You can just basically keep moving. And then when we spiral in again, we'll wind up the spiral and we'll let our chanting and our song turn into just a tone that we call a cone of power. And we imagine the power rising uh, like, a, like a cone and sending our intention out into the universe to bring it about. Um, and when we do that, that's when we will light the bay leaves uh, so that we can invoke that power of transformation and fire uh, and inhale a little whiff of that smoke um, and have a moment to find our own vision of the world that we want to create and our own commitment to what we want to do about it. Uh, then we'll see if there's time. We might have time to share that in the circle. If not, we'll open the circle and come back and we encourage people to talk about it 
while we're sharing food and socializing and dancing and other parts of ritual, <laughs> less formal. Uh, there's just a couple logistical things. If there are people here who physically can't dance or aren't comfortable dancing, um, we can bring a few chairs out and put them in the center of the circle. And uh, are there people here willing to carry some chairs out for those who might need them? Can you raise your hands? Yeah, great. So, um, but at that point when we're going to light the bay leaves, we're going to need to quickly get the chairs and the people out of the center of the circle so that you don't have burning bay leaves raining down on your head, which <laughs> is not really the point of this ritual. <laughs> um, We'll also have water in the center that has waters of the world in it from that original ritual and that now has water because we have kept some back from that political despair ritual 40 more or more years ago and use it to make offerings and collect water from sacred places. So there will be water in the center from every ocean and every continent and from sacred places all over the world and political actions we've been in uh, all over the world for the last 40 years. And uh, we're going to have a chance to create our circle by sprinkling each other and sprinkling it around. So. And uh, there is a song we'll be singing has two parts. And the first part goes, Elle change tout ce qu'elle touche, et tout ce qu'elle touche change. Elle change tout ce qu'elle touche, et tout ce qu'elle touche change. Try that. Elle change tout ce qu'elle touche, et tout ce qu'elle touche change. And then, you can sing an over and goes and rasen fair did i get that right and rasen fair pousse and rasen fair pousse and rasen fair pousse try some harmony and rasen change Hey, to scale, to change. Beautiful. Shall we do it? Do it. Right.